This podcast contains discussions of child abuse, sexual repression and sexual abuse, suicide, racism, misogyny, PTSD and PTSD symptoms, and spiritual oppression and abuse, including guilt, shame, and fear. In most episodes, we will be mentioning some of these concepts in a general way without any graphic detail. If any of these topics or other triggering topics will be mentioned in great detail, we will let you know at the beginning of each individual episode, as well as in the show notes for that episode. Welcome back to the Leaving Eden podcast. My name is Gabrielle Ha Cohen, and I am here with my co host. Hi, I'm Sadie Carpenter, and I am a weaker vessel than my coworker here, my co host. I am not as strong physically, I'm not as strong mentally, and I should stay in my lane and do my God given gender roles and have a servant's heart towards men. But God loves me just as much, and I'm worth as much, but also I'm weaker, and all my jobs are worse. So you're a weaker vessel. Yes. I think that's just because I had a baby. (laughs) And also because I drink way more caffeine than you. No, a weaker vessel is one way that women are described under complementarianism, which is the other piece of the puzzle of IFB marriage and gender role teaching that we haven't gone over. Yes. Okay. So today... We're talking about marriage. Okay, marriage is what brings us together today. Is that, that's Princess Bride. Right? To talk about all I ever hear from you is why am I not married? Where's my beautiful Jewish wife? <laughs> that's, oh, okay, that's a little bit true. Like half of our conversation. No, I'm. I'm. I, this is this is an interesting topic because uh, you know we've spoken at length about dating. We've talked about relationships. Like, what are the rules? What can you do? What can't you do? Today, we're here to talk about what happens if you are fortunate enough, um, as I hope to be one day, that the Lord blesses you with a godly wife or a, a godly husband. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> And I was never married in the IFB, but because I was assigned female at birth, marriage was supposed to be my whole goal. It was going to be the entire focus of my life. So I was being taught about the IFB view of marriage. I was hearing messages about that along with the rest of the church, but I was also getting focused instruction from a very young age. Girls and boys would be separated for teaching uh, at camps, at conferences, in youth group. And from what I hear, the boys got to play basketball, shoot arrows, hopefully not with Jack Scop, uh, because he'd make it weird. <laughs> and, <laughs> and talk about not masturbating, also hopefully not with Jack Scop, because he'd make it weird. But he'd, the, he'd, he'd have the shaft out. This is what arrow. not to do. He's like, this is what you don't do. <laughs> Watch uh. me do what you're not supposed to do for three minutes that will feel like three hours. <laughs> Uh, but the girls, we got to hear about modesty. We got to hear about if we, how if we tempt a boy to sin, it's our fault. And about how to prepare for the marriage that is going to be the focus of our entire adult lives. Because a woman's entire purpose in the IFB is to be a helper and a support to her husband and to make her life about him. Cindy Scott actually wrote a book with that title, A Wife's Purpose. But before we get into that, because this is a big topic for us, I just need to say that the Leaving Eden podcast is a podcast about Sadie Carpenter's life in upbringing, escape from the independent fundamental Baptist cult. So we talk about this cult, other cults, religion. We talk about fundamentalism, a real and present threat that, you know, the high pressure ideologies, cult ideologies pose to society as a whole. Um, We seek to promote freedom of mind, freedom of thought, and freedom of religion. So if you are a fan of this podcast, you can join our Patreon at patreon.com slash leaving Eden podcast. And there we have extended and uncensored versions of all of our episodes or most of our episodes, some of our episodes. 
most of them. So if you like us, then you can hear us talk about nonsense for longer than you would if you were listening to the regular episode. Uh, you can also join our Facebook group, which is full of a lot of new members, people posting their stories, people posting memes, people just posting good stuff in general. Love the Facebook group. We have a, the Facebook group is called Eden Exodus. So if you go to facebook.com slash groups slash Eden Exodus, it is Eden Exodus. It is there reddit.com slash r slash eden exodus it's our subreddit it's also a good hang got to thank our faith promise missions tier patrons the same four as before which is dd keppel kathleen moncrief jessica tambo like rambo and thank you for correcting me uh on the pronunciation of your name emory it is emory fair lasser not fair laser sadly i thought uh, he said fair losser fair losser yeah Fair um, Losser. But, okay. So, but like Amory Fair Losser you... said that he really likes to hear his name on air. So, Amory Fair Losser is a very cool listener of ours. But thank you to all of our Faith Promise Mission tier patrons. We really appreciate you so much. Um, some people have messaged me asking me why they don't hear our third co host, Baby Chuck, on the recording of last week's episode. Baby Chuck is asleep. I am, <laughs> I am trying recording in a closet after she goes to sleep. Because she's now crawling and trying to stand up. And that was a bit much for me <laughs> to handle while I'm trying to record. Oh, I can imagine. But baby Chuck is yeah. doing is doing great. She's all over the place. But I'm um, going to try recording mm -hmm. without her on my lap for a while. So, Sadie. Yes. We got a big topic today. It's IFB marriage. How are we going to start with this? How, how do you want to start it off? I want to tell you about the term complementarianism. I've heard this talked about most of my life. The basic teaching is that men are not more valuable or more worthy than women, but that men are assigned by God to different roles in life than women are. I heard the most interesting description of complementarianism when I was researching for the Doug Phillips Vision Forum episode. Someone described it as soft patriarchy, and reading it being described that way really helped me frame my thoughts for how I want to explain it to you in this episode. So complementarianism, that's when people say biblical gender roles, that's what they're talking about. So when people say biblical gender roles, they could mean hard patriarchy, biblical patriarchy, like what we described in the Vision Forum episode. Oh, but, so like IBLP. Uh, yeah, or the stricter side of the IFB. There are other religions that practice similar patriarchal views or other denominations of Christian Christianity, but they could also be describing complementarianism. Uh, it's, it's a spectrum. Misogyny and beliefs about gender and gender roles in fundamentalist Christians in particular run on, uh, on a spectrum. If you have biblical patriarchy all the way over to one side, like the IBLP or the Vision Forum teachings, if you have complementarianism near the middle and then you have egalitarianism, all the way over on the other side, then that kind of makes up the spectrum of Christian views towards gender roles and the role of women in life and in the church. So with egalitarianism, you're like, okay, we can have women be pastors. We can have women have roles in the church. Uh, right. If you're right, all the okay. way over, all the way over on egalitarianism, you could also be somewhere between complementarianism and egalitarianism and believe that women can do anything men can do except for pastor. So it's it's not like three train stations. It, it's really a very graduated spectrum. OK, that makes a lot of sense the way that you're explaining. So complementarianism, you're like saying, OK, women have these roles. Men have these roles. These are not more important than these, although these are low key than these yes exactly um but biblical patriarchy teaches that men are actually more important than women and hmm. can be closer to god and are more similar men are made in the image of god and women are made in the image of men complementarianism is is like a middle ground between that and egalitarianism which would say all people are made in the image of god ifb churches can fall anywhere on the spectrum from full patriarchy to full complementarianism. So we've talked about the far end of that spectrum when we covered biblical patriarchy. So I thought that in the interest of fairness and getting a full picture, we should cover the other side of the, the place where typical IFB churches fall. Talk about complementarianism, the specific teachings of the IFB about marriage, and as a special treat at the end, because I'm doing a theology episode, I'm, uh, I'm gonna have a little bit of fun and fill you in on the things that I think the IFB got right about marriage. Wow. So they didn't miss like um, every time. A, a I mean, broken clocks clock. right twice a day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
So okay. let's, let's dig into this and it, it is going to be fun. We talked about uh, Bill Gothard and the IBLP. I remember that one of these pr uh, principles is, okay, there's several immutable characteristics about a person that this person cannot change. And these are things from like time in history or conditions at birth to your gender. So mm -hmm. they see like they see your gender gender roles as basically being as essential to God's plan as how tall you are. Yes, because this is all tied into one factor of it is anti-trans thinking and rules against being transgender or non-binary. Because if you're assigned one gender at birth, but then you later identify as another gender and you transition, you're rejecting God's plan for your life. But it's not, they're not saying you're bad because you're rejecting God's plan for the way that your body should look and present and the clothing you should wear. Like that's part of it, but it's deeper than that because what they're saying is you're rejecting God's plan in every area of your life. So does that make more sense now? Because it's more, it's about way more than the way a person looks or how they function in the world, like what pronouns they use. And I guess Bill Gothard came out with this stuff before, I guess, being transgender was as mainstream as it is now. Uh, yes. But still, so yeah. who Bill Gothard was hating on would be lesbians and gay men who present like lesbians who present more masculine or gay men who present more feminine. Oh, OK. No, because that makes this perfect is before, sense. Like this is before being trans was like a thing in the media, like in the media and in our cultural narrative that everybody knew about. So we're talking like 60s, 70s, like Stonewall era mm -hmm. gay. OK, yeah, cause that's what Bill Gothard was fighting against. Okay, so but so, I, I still so I find it is this like it is yeah. about like the way you present. It is about what your body looks like, but it's also about so much more like your career, your future relationships, and how they function. The entirety of how you relate to yourself and your family, and how you live your life for the rest of your life, like your job, everything. No, I find this I find this concept from Bill Gothard like deeply ironic, though. Why is that? Because Bill Gothard thinks that gender is an immutable characteristic just like time and history but he's built an entire cult around trying to get back to the 1950s well the more i research fundamentalism the more i see this as a movement based on history and specifically the 40s and 50s i've talked before about how the modern fundamentalist movement goes back to the early 1900s it was a backlash against higher criticism which is the idea that the bible is true but can have errors or can be interpreted differently at different times in history. And the fundamentalist movement took off and gained momentum as soldiers came back from World War I with shell shock, which is what we now call PTSD, and they needed something to help stabilize their lives because there was no treatment for PTSD at the time. A generation later, World War II came around, and the men went to war, so we saw American women go to work in mass for the first time. Rosie the Riveter working in factories and wearing evil, evil pants. Mm. IFB preachers, by the way, Love to talk about this, how women working in factories and wearing pants was the beginning of the downfall of our society. Mm. So then, post-World War II in the prosperous mm. 50s, the majority of women went back to being homemakers, took a lot of uppers and a lot of downers, kept their house clean, and whispered to drugstore clerks to buy pads over the counter because that was seen as some kind of shameful thing that is not spoken about. It just so happened around the same time in the era of Mad Men and JFK being a young sen senator and the cultural idea of teenagers happening for the first time that the IFB sprung up around big, loud preachers like J. Frank Norris, Lester Roloff, John O. Rice, and a very, very young Jack Hiles who blasted out sermons from the pulpit about the de degeneracy in society. These teenagers going to movies and drinking milkshakes out of the same glass in soda shops and swimming in mixed gender groups in those uber revealing 1920s bathing suits. How dare they? Right. So because fundamentalism had such a surge in the 1950s because of the cultural moment, that era became idolized and the way things were became this huge rallying cry. There's also a factor of all the baby boom children. That's their childhood. And I think that the baby boom generation has gone on to carry the IFB to the point that it is because everyone is nostalgic for childhood. And for that generation, that is the way things were when they were children. And then fundamentalism hit its stride and has had its biggest years in the 80s when those baby boom children were young adults. So that's why fundamentalism is kind of perpetually stuck in the 50s and the 80s, because those are the good old days for those, for that group of people that is the core of current fundamentalism. That's so interesting. 
Because, like, if you look at the, the 80s aesthetically, the 80s took a lot from the 50s aesthetically. Okay. Yeah, uh, because the children I, I, of the 50s were the trend makers in the 80s. That's so... Okay, that's really... Okay, that's a so, really insightful... Uh, 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 it's like a unique combination of what fundamentalism was and the cultural moment there's there's a synergistic effect that's a very interesting thought i really I, that that's given me a lot to think about but i want to go back to something you said a little bit earlier because this is something that confuses so they're saying that women working in factories is the start of the downfall of society but women working in factories was also essential to the war effort so like do they wish that that hadn't happened the um, IFB answer to it is it was good that they worked in the factories to help us win the war, but letting them wear pants to work in the factories awakened the rebellious spirit in women. And uh, the women should have gone right back home to the kitchen after the war. But wearing pants is of the devil. And that made them rebellious because like they'd have a little taste of like, I don't know, the devil's goodness or whatever. And women got a big head because they'd been allowed to wear pants and then they didn't want to stay in their place anymore. And that's how feminism happened. That... Probably shouldn't tell them about first wave feminism, which was, you know, Oh God, 50, be... well, 30, and 30 years before that. Well, Steven Anderson says that women shouldn't vote, I guess. Yeah. So... We're going to get into that distinction yeah. <laughs> in a minute. No, no, no but this is because you know, who's all about the traditional family values and quote unquote, Western culture. Who's that? The people that we were bombing with the planes that the women were building in the factories. That's very true. Yeah. So uh... there's this episode is a big thing that I had to tackle. And now that it's over with, I'm going to take a break. And then I'm eventually going to have to get into Christian fundamentalism and white supremacy and how they intersect even for the, the sections of fundamentalists that aren't white supremacists or think they aren't. But for now, we should get into what some of those gender roles are are okay let's do it take us through this so it's nothing really mind-bending or unexpected i think it's all the things that you would associate with traditional western gender roles and the things that you would associate with the romanticized image of the 1950s so for men it's working providing for a family being the breadwinner but also any kind of manual labor hanging shelves and fixing cars and roofing and hunting for women it's keeping house, being pregnant, having children, raising children, cooking elaborate meals, sewing, being very modest, very feminine, and above all, being very subservient to their husbands. See, this is, I always find this interesting. Um, and I know that we touched on the nostalgia a little bit earlier, but is like, is there a name for this effect, the nostalgia for an like idealized version of a past that never really existed? Mm. You know, because like before everything was on camera, like right, we, we carry around smartphones, we take pictures of everything, we, you know, everything's on video. All we had, though, was like pictures of what the people wanted. Yeah. What, what, like, so you saw a picture that was very posed and all of the kids were smiling and happy because, you know, the dad's like, if you don't smile for this picture, I'm going to like smack it out of you with mm -hmm. my belt. Like, and, and like the moms on Quaaludes, like that, that's what you see. But, that, but like did that, that ever really exist? Yeah, but did that ever like? There's got to be a term for this. Uh, what is this effect called? Do you the, know? I don't know. There, I don't know. There has to be a term for it, though. It's not the Mandela effect. The Mandela effect is something else. The Mandela effect is like when you remember something that you thought happened, but that that thing didn't actually happen. But there's like a collective societal memory. Mm -hmm. Maybe okay. No, what I'm thinking of is I, like I'm gonna just start calling it the Lana Del Rey effect. You know, I think that I, I like that. I, I found this quote defining nostalgia. It's from Dr. Alan R. Hirsch, and it seems really relevant. The quote is, a longing for a sanitized impression of the past, not a true recreation of the past, but rather a combination of many different memories all integrated together and in the process, all negative emotions filtered out. Mm. But I'm, I'm going to go with the Lana Del Rey effect. I have feelings about her, but I'm not going to go on that tangent right now. All I'm going to say is wear a freaking mask. Yeah. So the entire, uh, like all of Christian fundamentalism seems to be based around like, the, so it's fifties nostalgia, but like pre Elvis fifties. So like when the number one song was how much is that doggy in the window? You know, that one, how much is oh, yeah, that my mom doggy? Used to sing that to me. Really? Yeah. That was one of my, like one of my number one lullabies growing up. So the IFB has a lot to say about how Elvis ruined America with his hip shaking on the Ed Sullivan show, corrupted all the young women, and also how the Beatles ruined America. Although I don't want to bash all 50s and 60s music because there is some good stuff in there. Like Patch the Pirate's favorite uh, musician to rip off uh, the new Christy <laughs> Minstrels. Yeah. 
for those in the know, somehow the Jericho Plan song did not manage to ruin Mr. Sandman for me. I still love that song. There's really? some, there was some good stuff out of the 50s and 60s. They they used Mr. Sandman because that song is like seen as like one of the first big hits that was a rock and roll song. Yeah, but they did like an acapella version of it. Uh, they they okay. they made a parody of it to to advertise the Jericho plan, which is another episode that we're going to have coming pretty soon. I guess rock and roll is OK if it's for Jesus. Maybe if it's a Hiles Anderson girls tour group singing it acapella. There's no drum, so it's fine. Yeah. So I think the question is, how do you get a 2000s woman to live by 1950s values? No shade on men, but I think it's got to be a lot easier to convince a man to live under this kind of arrangement than it is to convince a woman because he's getting a lot of benefits. So how do you convince this hypothetical woman? This is the way that she wants to live. How do you convince her husband that subjugating his wife and treating her that way is what God wants? It's very hard to convince people now that women should live in complete subjection to their husband. It's hard to convince people now that women are inherently less of a person than men are. Remember from the biblical patriarchy manifesto about man being made in the image and glory of God and woman being made in the image and glory of man. People don't tend to like that in 2021. <laughs> Very no, much. they don't. So there has to be something to bridge the gap between those teachings that we talked about before and modern equality, because the IFB, they don't subscribe to equality. They want to subjugate women, but they can't recruit any new people if they stay all the way on the side of patriarchy. So what they have is complementarianism. Okay, so... What is complementarianism? What do we got here? So complementarianism comes in and says, no, 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 no. Women aren't worth less than men. Everyone is equal before God and everyone is made in the image of God. But men and women are made to reflect different characteristics of God. Wait, so they're men and like we're all equal, but we're more equal than like Animal Farm. Yes. So they're communists. No. <laughs> <laughs> so... And it, it's complement, like C-O-M-P-L-E-M-E-N-T. Like they complement each other, not like saying nice things about each other. Like, Gabi, your beard looks your beard looks very nice today. Not Thank like you. that kind of comment. I don't I can't even see you. I just assume that it does. <laughs> <laughs> but not like that kind of compliment, like complimentary. So the men and women are meant to men reflect some parts of the image and being of God and women reflect other parts. And when you put them together in a marriage, it is a more complete reflection of who God is. Wait, so you're telling me that there is male parts of God and there's female parts of God. Uh, mm. So the way that you're describing this, God sounds intersex right now. Okay, so this is big if true. According to <laughs> IFB theology, God is intersex. I mean, technically, scripture says God is a spirit and they that worship spirit must, must worship in spirit and in truth. So technically, the IFB do not believe that God is a man. They just believe that God reveals himself as a man because men are meant to be natural leaders. Mm. Because it's the natural order of things that everybody follows men. And that's definitely not just because millennia of misogyny. No, mm. that's because it's natural. <clears throat> God is a spirit and has no gender, but he's still a man. But God has mm. no gender <laughs> and has both qualities that we consider masculine and feminine. But he's still a man, okay? But men and women are created to reflect different parts of God. And therefore, men should be masculine to reflect God. And women should be feminine to reflect other parts of God, who is still a man, but not. Mm. But he's still a man, but he's not a man. <laughs> <laughs> this is loopy. So they literally <sighs> define who God is to make it easier to subjugate women. Okay. Yeah. Wow. So, so complementarianism... <laughs> And, and remember, this is the much nicer option than biblical patriarchy. So complementarianism appro appropriates some of the language of second wave feminism. It teaches that men are not more valuable than women. They're not closer to God or their prayers don't get heard extra. Women shouldn't be oppressed. Women should be able to have driver's licenses and be able to vote and have credit cards, that sort of thing. So just as a refresher for people who don't know, first wave feminism, that was like the suffragettes. Uh, second wave feminism, that's women's lib movement in the 60s, 70s, you know. Third wave feminism, that was like 1990s 
I, that was a lot based on also like sexual liberation. Mm-hmm. Am I getting this right? Am I right about you know more about this than I? It, do. it was it was all steps. Um, because yeah. because women's sexual liberation in first wave feminism was the idea that some women don't get married or that some women would choose a career like journalism, like some of the first female journalists uh, over being married. And then sexual liberation in the 1970s was married women should be able to choose to go on birth control to not have a bunch of kids. And then sexual liberation in the 90s was like, oh, women can choose to have sex with people regardless of whether they're in a marriage or a long term partnership. So, yeah. It's always about different parts of liberation. In first wave feminism, it was about women can own property. And then in second wave, it was about women can have their own apartment. So it it's always about the same issues. It's just step by step. That's my perspective. Th- that makes sense. And then fourth wave feminism is the one where you make the boys cry on Tumblr. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Fourth wave feminism. That's the one where it's all like uh, trans inclusive and stuff. Fourth, so, yeah, fourth wave feminism yeah. is going to split into... Yeah. Yeah, they're going to they're going to they're going to split into TERFs and non-TERFs and it's going to be uh, interesting. Yeah, that sounds like a uh, So complementarianism stops short of the 1990s third, third wave, which was basically women can do anything a man can do. Women can be construction workers or a CEO or the president and as an individual, a woman in society should be seen as no different than a man in society. Complementarianism teaches that there are roles that are best suited for men and roles best suited for women in relationships, in the home, and in the outside world, in the business world, and that men and women are created to be two parts of the same whole. So the fine line that they draw, let's look at a common feminism example, the idea that a woman could and should one day be president. Biblical patriarchy says, no, a woman is not capable due to her gender. She should not be due to God's laws. Equality or modern feminism says a woman is just as capable. She could make decisions. She could have the brain power to do that job and she'd be fine. Complementarianism says, well, yes, a woman is just as capable. Yes, she could make the decisions and she could have the brain power to be president, but she shouldn't because leadership is a man's role. So she should restrain herself and not run for president because it's not Mm. God's plan. Because if God wanted her to be president, he would have made her born a man. That, okay, that that makes sense the way that you're explaining it. So so feminism or equality says you can and you should. Patriarchy says you can't and you shouldn't. But complementarianism complementarianism says, I I am going to trip over that word so many times in this episode. Complementarianism says you could, but you shouldn't. Okay. That's that's easy to remember then. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So complementarianism says women are special and they should be honored because the relationship between a man and a woman shows the relationship between God and the church. Hmm. Okay. So when you were a teenager, how heavily was this being preached to you? Would you would you hear your pastor talking about the roles of women or would that be the more the thing that the pastor's wife would be talking to the ladies about uh, it, like in a special ladies meeting? First, let me say that IFB churches can fall anywhere between patriarchy and complementarianism. And my church growing up was pretty close to the center between those two ideologies. So I was hearing uh, I was hearing principles from patriarchy, like the teaching that women are owned by the men in their life, your property of your father until your property of your husband. But I was also hearing principles from complementarianism, like women should be able to vote. Because so full on patriarchy would have been like quiverful. And you guys weren't quiverful or, or, or uh, IBLP. Patriarchy is also associated strongly with women not voting, supporting household voting, or if you do vote, just letting your husband effectively have two votes by telling you exactly who to vote for. Like Steven Anderson. Right. Uh, I don't think his wife votes. Huh. Okay. Well, so full on complementarianism is like, what does that look like? Is that like girl defined, like fundy light? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now that you've explained. Okay. So complementarianism, to make this even a little bit more complicated, it extends into the wider world of Christianity and evangelicalism. You would hear harder or softer versions of complementarianism preached everywhere from the IFB to Southern Baptist or Methodist or non-denominational modern churches. My biggest problem with complementarianism is less that it controls women because it doesn't control women nearly as much as more patriarchal points of view. My problem with it is that it others 
women. Like, men are the standard issue and women are the other thing. And it still enforces the gender binary. And it still does acknowledge that being a leader of any kind, a leader of a home, a leader of a church, or a leader of a business, is a male role. And, like, if you want that in your relationship, and that's, like, what you feel like empowers you, you're like, I want these roles that I feel like are the role for a woman and, you know, my... Mm -hmm partner is is a man and i want him to have these like that's fine if you want to go for it i feel like the problem is if you're having that as church doctrine like you know you can't opt out of it that's that's the problem here i mean my my husband works and my primary job is child care because that happens to be the best way that it works for our family so i'm not i'm certainly not hating on anybody who has a western traditional family structure of course that's not for ideological reasons that's just how it happens to be uh, yeah it's, for, it's yeah. because he has 10 years more job experience than i do yeah because i was in a cult <laughs> <laughs> which tends to get you. you can't escape they're like you will be a can wife you... and mother and you're like no can you ex way... <laughs> can you explain this gap in your resume yes i was in a cult <laughs> It's a real problem, uh, which is why. Have you ever been asked that in an interview? Have they been like, "Can you explain this?" Like, in... no, I have. I have creative ways of of avoiding that question. <laughs> you wait, so you couldn't just like go into the interview and they'd be like, "So why didn't you?" Wh uh, what happened here? You be. I was in a cult. This is. These are the years when I was getting out. <laughs> I was studying for a religious vocation, and then later I determined that that wasn't the right path for me. Ah. Uh. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you don't have to tell them, like, straight up, I was in a cult. I'm no, like, now. I usually like... do, because, like, let's be serious, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, oh, interesting, were you going to go to seminary? No, I was in a cult. <laughs> so I just, I just phrase oh, it like... Were you going to like... be a nun? No, I was in a cult. <laughs> I phrase it like... Yeah, I phrase it like I was, I was discerning to be a nun, and then I decided not to. <laughs> so it gets less questions. You're like, oh, that's interesting. Well, I have, I have respect for that. No. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you don't want to know what I was doing. <sighs> yeah, it's a, it's when you it's when you can't opt out of something that it that it's way more of a problem. Yeah. So I don't like complementarianism because of the reasons that I just listed, but I hate it a whole lot less than I hate straight up patriarchy. If you've ever heard the phrase the man is the head of the household but the woman is the neck that turns the head. Mm -hmm. Uh that's a, it's a common phrase that I wouldn't expect you to have heard but I'm sure a lot of our listeners have. That phrase can describe marriage and family dynamics in the range someplace between patriarchy and complementarianism. That's such a weird phrase. We've kind of been in the weeds of like the theory of this, and I think it would be helpful to bring in a hard example. Uh, what's a common decision that a couple would need to make? I don't know, like something financial. Okay, how about buying a second car? Okay. Like they have one cool. car, they're okay. So Bob and Jane are trying to decide whether they should buy a second car. Let's say for our example, Bob says that they don't need one, but Jane says that they do need one. Right, because they have kids and she needs a car so she can go grocery shopping during the day when Bob's at work. Okay. Right. right. Makes sense. Okay, so under patriarchy, Bob does the family finances. He leaves every day to go to work. Jane is stranded at home with the kids, homeschooling. Uh, if one of the kids is sick, Jane has to stay home with them, and Bob takes everybody else to church, and she's stuck at home with the kid. Bob says, no second car, we don't need one, and that's the end of that. Because under patriarchy, he's in charge. If he says no, too bad, so sad. Under a mix of the two philosophies, so closer to where I grew up on this spectrum... Bob or Jane might be in charge of family finances. So in the IFB, it's okay for the wife to to write the checks and pay the bills as long as the man makes the majority of the money. And That's Jane impressive. under like under a mix of so someplace between patriarchy and complementarianism, Jane shows Bob how they would be able to afford a second car. She begs and pleads him. She spends some time on her knees, which we're going to discuss in a in an episode coming out next week. Mm. And maybe she can convince him to say yes. But here's the important distinction. Anything short of complementarianism and Bob still has the final vote. Under complementarianism, to its full extent, technically the two have equal votes it's supposed to be exactly 50-50. In reality, it's still like 51-49. In, in most complementarian marriages, the man still has just the slightest edge in the power balance. Of course, under any of these, if Bob decided that he wanted like a jet ski, he could 
to like go buy a jet ski and she would be in church saying jane would be in church saying the lord has blessed us <laughs> with the financial freedom to buy this jet ski <laughs> True, but also I follow a lot of parenting boards on the internet and based on what I see there, I think that's just society. Like I think men as a whole holding just a little bit more power than women as a whole in the average relationship, I think that's the way a lot of secular marriages function. I think a lot of men behave that way without any religious reasoning at all. I think that's maybe just our society in the way that it is. So if your husband goes out and buys a jet ski without consulting you, what do you do? My husband bought something much less expensive than a jet ski, but still over our limit of what we would need to consult each other on one time several years ago. We had a nice conversation about it, and I expressed that he shouldn't do that. And he agreed that he shouldn't have done that. And he hasn't done anything like that since, and neither have I because equality that is very mature of you but like like if if he bought a jet ski like what would oh, you do you mean in the ifb world yeah like okay, if, i'm so like sharing personal if, stories here and you're like no, no tell me if, the IFB. if you're jane like and, jane. and bob goes by and buys a jet ski what does jane do okay because in the real world we had a talk and we decided not to do that again and it was fine that's how you do things as mature adults that are no in the ifb world you would remember that you are commanded to submit to your husband and you'd smile and keep sweet about it you'd keep doing your thing figure out a way to cut the grocery budget not get your nail not get your hair and nails done and definitely not say i told you so when it gets repoed in three months never allowed to say i told you so never not that it's a good idea in the real in the real world but in the ifb you're not allowed to i want to say i think that homer simpson would absolutely love this system (laughs) <laughs> this may this may be the thing that finally gets me canceled, but I think the Simpson marriage shows some aspect some aspects of complementarianism. So Marge, really, okay, Marge huh. has power in the relationship. What but does she do though? She her power is to go. <laughs> like... <laughs> but a lot of times she chooses not to use her power. We do see some excellent feminist moments out of her. But there are a lot of times when Homer goes off on some wild idea, like when he quit his job at the power plant just before he found out that Maggie was on the way because he wanted to work his dream job at the bowling alley. And Marge was like, "Mm, I don't know, homie. But she could have put her foot down and been like, no, you can't do that. Even though she had or should have had that power, she didn't use that power to avoid conflict or because he isn't really going to listen to her. And if she does try to assert herself, he's just going to steamroll her anyway. Yeah. And in situations where she probably should assert not just her influence, but her authority over what goes on in her own home and with her own money, she often doesn't. And the show doesn't make any claim that Marge and Homer aren't equal partners, but she's never really treated as equal. Yeah. So I'm just going to huh. say the Simpsons are complementarian as com- complementarianists. They practice complementarianism. Okay, let's go to break before we go into like a huge Simpsons tangent, because I know that like if we wanted to, we could like have an entire show just about Simpsons episodes. I don't know why we haven't talked about religion and the Simpsons. That would make a whole episode. But yeah, we're going to go to break. Then we're going to come back um, and then we'll talk about how this stuff actually works in practice. Hey, Sadie here. If this is your first time listening to the Leaving Eden podcast, make sure you go back and check out episode 57. It's a primer episode for new listeners. That episode tells my personal story and gives you all the terms and information that you'll need to know going forward. Also, check out our cult true crime series, The First Family of Fundamentalism, so that you can get the whole cult story. If you like our show, you can support us by joining our Patreon, where we have extended and uncensored episodes, as well as other bonus content available. You can also join in the discussion in our Facebook group, That group is called Eden Exodus. Tell a friend, tell a family member, tell your worst enemy. The Leaving Eden podcast is a fully independent podcast, and we really appreciate your support. Now, back to the show. Okay, so we are back. We're going to talk about complementarianism, biblical, uh, IFB, whatever, marriage, how this works in practice, how what these marriages actually look like, how they function. Yeah, and I'm going to focus on this from the perspective of the specific mix of these philosophies that I grew up with and the specific teachings that I was taught, because that's what I know best. Yeah. So if you were raised in the IFB, you were taught something slightly different. Uh, Your experience may vary. but Yeah. If you were raised in the IFB, you were probably taught something similar to this, but there's probably some area that's different. Lots of variation. Okay, let's do it. So what I was told, these are the, the philosophies that I was hearing from a young age that really stuck with me. 
I was told that Eve was made in Adam's image, not God's image. As man is created to serve God, woman is created to serve God through her service to man. Women are supposed to be generally submissive to all male authority. So does this mean, uh, for example, so say I said, I want you to bake me a cake, then you would have to do it. If I was just some random guy from your church. No, not if you were just a random guy from the church. But it does mean that if your pastor or your husband or any man in official church leadership says, I want you to bake me a cake or the pastor of any other church, probably, then you should do it because disobeying authority is the same as disobeying God. Mm. So that part is taken from patriarchy. If some rando guy from the church tells you to bake a cake, you can say no, but you have to be really, really nice about it. Because if you make a man mad, then you're not obeying God. See, what I would do, I would just go around telling random women that I wanted peanut brittle. You know, I would just go around saying that it was God's will that I should have some homemade peanut brittle next church service or like lemon bars or something. Go to. Oh, do you like lemon bars? Like the ones with the shortbread on the bottom and like the custardy lemon stuff and the little powdered sugar on the top? Is that a trick question? No, I'm seriously asking. Do people not like lemon bars? Jonathan doesn't like them very much, so I don't make the them, f- even though I love them. Sadie, I've... Uh, I, I mean, I, I did I, see you. <laughs> I did see the way you eat the, you eat the lemon meringue pie. Yeah. <laughs> so it, I should have figured. Look, like, I like Jonathan, I'll, I'll, but like the lemon bar, that's a red flag. <laughs> Let's be honest here. That's a red, like... No, he... Um, I know he, you guys have a child together, but like a man who doesn't like lemon bars, <laughs> what, like, what are you doing? He doesn't like them. It's just that he... They're not his favorite. He's he's picky about desserts. Mm-hmm. Like he'll he'll eat anything and be nice about it. It's just like the things that he really really likes are not the things that I like making the most. But it's fine. Okay. I make him his I... his apple crumble and his apple crisp that he loves. That that sounds but, also f-ing delicious. <laughs> but if you're that into lemon bars, then I will make up a reason for us to have a business meeting and make some lemon bars. I would absolutely love it if you would do that. That would be great sounds like Um, a plan but i won't do it because you told me to because you're not my god-given authority i no, i just brought it up as like a a, a hypothetical man i would just but i would like if i could do that if i could just go around telling people that they had to bake me things like then and then like the next time i saw them they would give me something that they baked for me that would that's like a superpower you'd have to be a pastor okay you know what now i see the appeal of going to these like <laughs> cult bible colleges man go to you Hiles Anderson tell... for four years free lemon bars for life you could just tell people to bake for you and they have to do it genius i mean the, the problem genius. is that the pastors can just tell women to do, to do other things and they feel like they just have to do it mm. i was also taught the umbrella thing that we've talked about with the iblp but in the iblp the umbrellas are husband wife children And the promise is, if you do this, you're protected. In the IFB, there's a pastor added in. So it's God, pastor, husband, wife, children, instead of God, husband, wife, children. Uh, And the promise isn't... So pastoral authority is a much bigger deal in the IFB. The IBLP is known for home churches or very small churches. Um, Like we talked about Doug Phillips being an elder in his church because I don't think they had a formal pastor. They just had a group of elders who ran the whole thing and like took turns preaching. Number two, the doctrine of men being in charge being a protective thing is not played up in the IFB. What's played up more is this is the correct way to do things and you'll get a blessing for staying in your lane and staying under your umbrella. But the direct promise of protection isn't there. People who have escaped the IBLP will say... That they were told, if you step out from the under the umbrella of protection, you're going to be physically hurt or injured or die. That mm. isn't the focus. The IFB sort of teaches that, but that's not the focus. The focus is a blessing, not a protection. So that's something the IFB taught that was taken from patriarchy, but modified a little bit. I'm trying to get my head around it. So if God is protecting you, if you do this, does that mean that if you don't do this, then God isn't protecting you? Yes. But Mm. that's an IBLP teaching specifically about protection. So the IBLP teaches if you disobey your father, God will remove his protection from you and something bad will happen to you imminently. The IFB teaches that if you disobey your father, God will take his hand of blessing away from your life. So you might miss out on something good that God wanted you to have. 
Oh, so it's carrot and stick. Okay. Yeah. So it's the different. It's the difference between God ceasing to protect you or God ceasing to bless you. Okay, so that's what happened to the guy that crashed his car from the brain in the jar store. He disobeyed. Who did he disobey? The pastor? No. And then he, he crashed the yes. car. And yeah, but he he wasn't outside of God's protection because he disrespected the pastor. He was being punished by God for disrespecting the pastor. Wait, what's the difference between God punishing you and God not protecting you? Well, there's no difference in outcome. The outcome is physical injury or death or something else really bad happening to you or somebody you love being physically injured or dying. Mm. The difference is just the philosophy of whoever is threatening you with these terrible things that they're predicting are going to happen to you. Right, because you were always telling me that when you were a kid, uh, you were afraid that if somebody you knew was was sinning, then you would die to teach them a lesson. Yes. Okay, so this is that. Yeah, this is this is that. Okay. So so it's just it's the same threat. It's just different reasons. And it's just a slightly oh. different method of control. The threat is the same. So I'm I'm moving on to another way that the IFB toes the line between patriarchy and complementarianism. The IFB teaches that when women submit, they are actually the ones with the most power in the situation. I was taught that women gain power by submitting. And this is something that you might hear outside the IFB as well. Many different types of anti-feminist people will use this rhetoric. Basically, what a secular person who's against feminism, like a trad wife or a white supremacist or whatever, might say is that fighting the patriarchy is pointless because the patriarchy and men being in control is a natural human thing. So a far better way for women to have power in the situation is to give up their power. Oh, like George Washington. What? Yeah, so George Washington decided that he didn't want to be king. When he was president, he decided that he would give up his power and not run for a third term. Yeah, that's he did that. But how did that get him more power? Because him peacefully, you know, saying, I don't want to be king. I want to be president instead. That set the precedent for the future of the country, right? So the country yeah. could be powerful. And him deciding that he would peacefully transfer the power that... Yeah, that set up the future, you know, so if you're president and you're not a king, you can govern more effectively because it's with the consent of the governed. So you don't have ultimate power, but you, you can govern more effectively. That's not power, though. He He's remembered well, and he set an important precedent, but that doesn't change the fact that he's dead now and he has no political power now, and he probably would have had more power in his lifetime if he had just been the king. I guess you're right. I don't know. Huh. So I would say this doesn't work. Maybe George Washington, not not the best example. Well, I would say that it just doesn't work in real life. Because from, from my experience, we were told that women gain true power by giving up their power and giving up the illusion of control in their relationship. But you know I, that meme where it's like, I receive, yes. you receive? <laughs> like, that's what I'm picturing. That, that's, a, that, <laughs> that's about right. But I don't think that I've really seen women get more power by doing this. Of course, the people who support this are going to say um, 1 Corinthians 2.14, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. So I just thought I'd get out ahead of that one because people who support this are going to say, well, you don't understand it because you're a natural person and you're not filled with the Holy Spirit. So I thought I'd let people know. Yes, I do know about that verse. Queen Elizabeth didn't get married, oh, right? Oh, Elizabeth, Elizabeth I, Elizabeth Tudor. Yeah, Elizabeth I, because she didn't want to share power. Is yeah. that right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, because if she got married, then she would not have the position that she did. I was taught the complementarian view that women and men show different sides or aspects of God. And while women are still meant to be submissive to husbands and authority... Femininity is just as valid of an expression of divinity as masculine as masculinity is. See, that's a perfectly fine thing to be taught. Yeah, saying that masculine and feminine are both expressions of the divine. I would personally, like, how I would say that is I would personally say that expressing whatever identity that you have is valid expression of divinity, valid expression of God. One expression of gender isn't superior to a different expression of gender. Uh, but of course, well, they're not they're going to have an issue with it saying that way. You know, I'm setting a timer on my phone for 30 seconds, um, <clears throat> but I'm going to get on a soapbox here. <laughs> uh, the Bible does not say that God is both masculine and feminine. The Bible says that God is a spirit and transcends gender. 
And if you think of God as being the expression of all gender, like God is every gender, then any person, regardless of their gender, like any man, woman, transgender person, non-binary person, agender person, whatever they are, that person is a reflection of some part of God. Like no matter, like no matter what your gender is, then you are an expression of some part of God because God is all genders. Okay, I'm done. I think it's important that you said that we are a I'm gonna queer start. affirming <laughs> podcast, top tier. Okay. Oh, I have one more, one more view for you that I was taught. Yeah. That comes more from the complementarian side. I was taught that men and women are equal before God, that a woman's prayers have just as much effect on God as a man's prayers do. There are still all of these qualifiers from the point of view that I was taught. A lot of people who subscribe to this would still say that women can't be pastors, would still say that a husband should have final authority over all family matters. Things like that I certainly don't agree with. This the complementarianism side, it isn't the worst thing ever. It's not good, but it's not the worst thing ever. It's not biblical patriarchy. Which is the worst thing ever. <laughs> so how does this play out in practice? I didn't have an IFB marriage, so I can't give you too much inside information. But I can tell you about the expectations of an IFB marriage based on everything that I was taught when I was being told that my entire life's purpose was to prepare for one. So when you were a teenager, what were they telling you you could expect from when you got married? Like I said in the introduction, I was taught that a woman's entire life purpose is to be a helper for her husband. This is based on a verse in Genesis. When God says about Adam, I will make a help meet for him. Help meet is two words, although the fundies will use it as a noun, as one word, help meet. It means a fitting helper or an appropriate helper. In an IFB marriage, the wife is allowed to have her own thoughts and interests and life, sort of. She's allowed to have a hobby, but the purpose of her life, the main number one priority of her life is supposed to revolve around her husband. And she can have a hobby as long as that hobby is like knitting and sewing. Yeah, or like if she, I'm trying to think of a, I was going to say rock climbing, but that's not IFB approved. You can't rock climb because you have to wear pants for that. Yeah, because you can't wear pants. So I'm trying to think like what, like an IFB wife, I guess, could work out at a gym. You can't do leg day though. Right. You couldn't can't do... run. You can't run in the you skirt, can, can you? Yeah, I know. I have, I have friends who do. So it could be some running. Difficult. That could be hmm. a hobby for an IFB wife. But she would be expected to set her run schedule at the most convenient time of day for her husband in a way that doesn't put any additional pressure on him. Like she couldn't run while he was cooking dinner. Or run while he was taking care of the kids. She'd have to go out super early in the morning before the kids got up. Interesting. So she'd have to have like a skirt made out of like sweatsuit material. Mm -hmm. So what you do is you get sweatpants and you get really, you get much larger than your size. Like whatever your size is, you go up three to four sizes. And then you have all this extra material and you sew that together into oh. a loose over top skirt. And then you wear leggings, you cut slits up the sides that are high enough where you can actually move your legs. And then you wear leggings under that so that your knees don't show. Kind of like my swimwear that I've put pictures of in the Facebook group. Okay, okay. That's I'm what that was made okay. out of. Yeah, so, so in the IFB, women have a little bit more freedom than they do under the strictest biblical patriarchy on average. But if you have a hobby, it's got to work around your husband's schedule. Whatever, like, you're not only expected to cook dinner, you're also expected to cook dinner that is convenient for your husband. So if he's on a particular diet, you've got to comply with that. Yeah, so it's it's every little thing. I was taught that my future husband would be able to choose what I wore, how I did my hair and makeup, even my personality. Because all of that is supposed to be a part of being the best possible helper to him. Well, he gets to pick your personality? Yeah, like out of a catalog, almost. Like a create a character in you playing Skyrim. Yes, play, what? because you're really just an NPC to your husband. Mm, I don't like that. It's creepy. It like we were literally taught how to adjust our personality permanently. So once you find a, a long term like boyfriend or fiance, who somebody that you know you're going to marry, we were taught how to purposely and permanently change our personalities to fit him and what he so, needed. So you were in more than one relationship when you were in the IFB. Yeah. Which like, so how did that, how did that work? Did you, did you like literally find yourself changing your, how did your personality change between the different relationships that you had? If you don't mind, like, I know that you don't like going into talking about those things because that's other people's private business for you. Mind. How did you? Yeah. Yeah. I don't mind giving an, an example if I can think of one. Okay. I had a boyfriend who was very into history. So I took that up as my hobby. Um, even though researching 
specific historical fun stories is fun to me, but reading tomes about this battle and then this battle and then this battle and then this battle is not fun to me at all. Oh, but like military history, not like... Because that's the thing. When men care about history, they're like, well, how, what happened? There was a war. Who killed who? Like, <laughs> And like, that's that's fine if that's what you're interested in. But I'm, I'm, I'm really not. You don't see men that are into like art history or like sometimes right. you do. But Which like, I'm way more, inter- more interested in. You're like, oh, let me study this change in artwork between the Renaissance and the medieval period. That would be cool thing to have a husband into. A lot more time than you would normally spend on like boyfriend or girlfriend's hobby trying to learn about all that stuff because whatever Hmm. he's interested in you're supposed to be interested in that's interesting because you find that like and this is something that you hear from time to time when you talk about when you talk to people who are like abused or in abusive relationships or even some people who maybe they weren't in abusive relationships but they grew up with a low self-esteem they're like i find myself disappearing into my partner's personality Mm -hmm. yeah and the ifp actually teaches Mm. you how to do that that's so insidious. So I'm yeah, so I met Jonathan yeah. and he's super into heavy metal music and my instinct was you've got to like every band that he likes because okay, it's like it's time to take on his personality. That's rough. And then I realized that like I do like a lot of the same bands that he likes and some of the bands that he likes I just don't like. Um and and learning that that's okay and that I can have my own like I don't have to have the same favorite band as him. I, he loves Kiss and Metallica. I like Kiss and Metallica. Neither one of them is anywhere near my favorite band, though. So yeah. so learning that, like, I can like the things that he likes, but I don't have to completely take on his personality. That was weird. As I'm continuing to prepare you for your future role as an IFB wife, you, you're supposed to take care of everything you possibly can to take everything off your husband's shoulders. So you're supposed to be like, he picked you out of a catalog. The only thing that you're supposed to that he's supposed to have to be responsible for is providing for the family and doing church stuff, pastoring, being a missionary, being a layperson, soul winning, teaching Sunday school, whatever his role in the church is. It's about molding and shaping yourself to be the best possible wife to him and making his life as easy as possible. That's a big ask, though. It is, is, but I was raised to see that as normal. So it goes back to something that I said in a very early episode about never complaining. I've told this example If you're in the car and the air conditioning is up too high, you're supposed to, as an IFB wife, get a sweater. Instead of bringing your husband's mood down by being negative about the temperature and inconveniencing him by asking him to turn down the air conditioner. And you can't reach over and turn it down yourself. No, because he's comfortable at the temperature where it is. How dare you make him less comfortable just because you are uncomfortable? Who were the people that were telling you this? Was this your pastor? Was assistant pastor, pastor's wife? I was hearing this, this stuff. I was hearing this more from female leaders. So I went to Lady Spectacular, which will probably get its own episode as well. But Spectacular is when all the IFB ladies go to First Baptist Church of Hammond for three days and they have a ladies conference and they get preached to by all the women, like the pastor's wives and assistant pastor's wives from First Baptist Church of Hammond, which is apparently fine if there are no men in the room. I feel like Ladies Spectacular should be the name of like a a drag show. (gasps) Oh, my God. Do we have any former IFB drag queens? Do we? Because, I don't well, know. Yeah, Do Dinah we have any? that camp. Dinah's from like a totally different camp. Right. We got to have some. Okay. Any former IFB drag queens, please make a show called Ladies Spectacular. It would be a song. Ladies Spectacular. Like, you know, I can, I can there's a song. It. I can see it just like glitter, bombs exploding, mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. A disco ball, strobe lights, like... Oh my god, that would be the best thing ever. Just, man. Well, Lady Spectacular, the conference, <laughs> was a bit less spectacular. Was, it was a bit less spectacular. Um, that was, it was at a Lady Spectacular when I was sitting, uh, I was sitting, you you all remember Richard, my, I wouldn't even say boyfriend, the very, per- the very first person I dated when I was in high school. Uh, I was sitting with his mother at a Lady Spectacular when Jack Scott came up and did an entire sermon about sex. For like two hours and I was like 16 and sitting next to the mother of the guy that I was going out with. It was the worst. And you didn't know any of this stuff. He, I, don't, like... I mean, Scott wasn't graphic really in that sermon. He it was him. No, he was doing his like three way, three way with Jesus theory. That's what it was about. Oh, so it wasn't just like make sure he gets it every X number of 
It was that, Jay's, okay. but also his Three Way with Jesus sermon. So what, like, so you're 16 at this time. What age were you when you started getting this oh, message? Teachings about about marriage. The things like Ladies Spectacular. They would split all the young girls out during the day, and all of our moms would go to like the the grown up sessions, and we would go to the kids sessions. I was hearing lessons about purity, submission, about what marriage would be like, and how to prepare for it. There were also split sessions at camp. All the girls would go to one place. All the boys would go to the other. I was hearing it there. So 12 at the very oldest. 12. But okay, my dad wasn't like super into the patriarchy sides of this, but he was mentioning some of the teachings that I've mentioned in church here and there and guest preachers would mention it in church and so on. So I was hearing bits and pieces about women are to be submissive and women are to obey men. I was hearing little pieces of that from the time I could sit still in church. But when you're hearing this at this age, so are you comprehending what it means like fully or are you just intellectualizing it? Like, or so you like know what it means or you don't know what it means or like you or you know what it means, but you don't know like fully what that entails for your life. So how I would characterize learning about this, you know that you can tell a kid one thing, but the kid can get a totally different impression that kids make connections between things that you might not expect kids jump to conclusions so you can tell a kid that the bath water goes down the drain and gets cleaned and then comes back through our pipes and we drink it but the kid might think that their favorite toy will go down the drain and then come back through the kitchen sink next week so they put their toy down the drain because they want to see it come out the kitchen sink because they have part of the knowledge that they need Oh. And they just jump to a conclusion. You can tell a kid one thing and then they jump to conclusions or they'll make connections that you might not expect them to make. So I was hearing all of these teachings, like bits and pieces piecemeal as a kid and as a young teen. And what I've said in this episode is what I was being taught. But the conclusion that I jumped to in my kid brain was that men are inherently better, inherently more valuable to God, and that women are second class citizens and basically, women are a necessary evil to bring more babies into this world. Hopefully more male babies. So that's not, nobody was telling me that straight up. But that is the conclusion that my kid brain came to. And this is something that I, I want to make that distinction because it's okay for adults to believe what they want to believe if it's not hurting anyone. But I, this is why I don't support this kind of teaching being aimed at children ever, even if their parents are believers, because children are going to jump to conclusions and children are going to be, I mean, I was angry at God for making me a girl. And like I don't, like I identify as a, at least a feminine person. God, if you could have made me one of two things, why did you make me the worst thing? Like, yeah. do you not okay. like me? Like what's going on? Yeah, you know what I would compare uh, this whole thing to? What? Like, at least the the conclusions are the not quite... Maybe you'll see where I'm going. So you know how... And maybe this is a bit of like a tangent. I don't know if this is a tangent. You know how people in this country always hype up blue collar jobs as like good, honest, solid paying jobs? Like, you know what yeah, I'm saying? good, honest work. Good, honest work. Like, so... I, I've had various like blue collar, white collar and like service industry jobs. I've worked at a lot of different places. I've worked for the U.S. Postal Service. I have worked as a welder. I have worked at a grocery store. Um, I have worked uh, doing paperwork at a car dealership. Uh, just various things throughout, you know, my my life uh, that I've jobs that I've had. You know what people do not tell you about these blue collar jobs that they are hyping up? That they're like, these are the jobs that America needs. Like, Okay, number one, I did not know that you had ever done welding. I think that is, I think welding is super cool. And I'm a little bit jealous. But what learned. don't people tell you? The reason why I don't talk about this that much is because it sucked ass. Okay? Like, they'll tell you, on, like, they'll just put you on a shift, right? And it'll just be like, I guess you work night shift now for the next five years until you get enough seniority to mm -hmm. transfer to the day. Shift. Like you're just like, OK, well, your life is that you work from 8 p.m. until uh, 4 a.m. That's your job now. That's your life. Five years. That's what you're doing. We might need you for overtime. So there goes your Saturdays too. sometimes, mm -hmm. I, I have, guess, whatever. Like I've worked night shift and it sucks. It like, does suck. It's bad. Whatever it is they're paying these people, you know, that are working these jobs, they should double it because I mean, a lot of this work is also extremely physically taxing and not just like, oh, you have to lift heavy things. But like, uh, you know, you 
like you get there, you're 24, 25, you're showing up to work and you see these guys who are like 55, 60 and their bodies are ruined. Okay. Like mm-hmm. they can't stand up straight. They're coughing because they've been inhaling like fumes and like powdered slag or whatever from the welding torch. And I'm just like 25. I'm like, I am not going to keep doing this because I like, I I'm in physically good health. I don't want to look like that when I'm 55, when I'm 60, like they do not yeah. pay people. Like that's what people don't talk. They're like, so, Oh, these are good, solid paying jobs that are like, yeah, but they fucking ruin your body. So what's the comparison that you're seeing between that and the life of an IFB wife? Okay. So where I'm going with this is, so we intellectualize the idea of a quote unquote, honest day's work or whatever, pretending that it's something like glorious instead of something that's just like brutal and has to be endured. And that's what they're teaching you about what your marriage is going to be like. You're like, you're going to go in and you're going to get married And you're going to submit to your husband and it's going to be this glorious thing. And then you get there and you're like, I got to submit to my husband now. He's a fucking idiot. Like, (laughs) well, he's a 22, 22 year old who just graduated from Hiles Anderson College. Like, yeah, yeah. he wears jeans to bed and drinks Mountain Moo. Like, and I got to sit for breakfast. I got to sit, like, submit to this guy, like. And never say anything against him. Well, that and I think that's where we get like the Christian trope of like marriage is so hard. Marriage is a constant battle, but I'm so blessed to have my spouse. Is that why? But I think this that's, is why. That's got to be why. Like, man. I think this is one of the major causes that that's like a Christian trope. I think persecution complex is another part of it. But but I think like this is one of the biggest causes of that being a Christian trope. But speaking huh. of something brutal that has to be endured. I want to talk about some of what the IFB taught about sex and marriage. Oh, God. So some of their most toxic views, in my opinion, are their views about sex and marriage. And then um, that's probably going to get slightly dark. So I'm going to finish it up by talking about the things that they surprisingly got right. So previously, we've talked about this, that uh, young people in the IFB are not given any real sex education to what, like 90 days before their wedding day? Is that what it is? So the the talk about this is how you do the thing that you're not supposed to do, that talk doesn't happen until 90 days before the wedding. But the teachings on sexuality and the role of sex in a marriage start as a teenager. But like before the 90 days, let's so say you don't know P into the V? Right. Like you, you are don't... not supposed to. You're not supposed to. What? Pretty much everybody does, but you're not supposed to know that like are there people who don't know oh like, yeah going absolutely into, um like what my, percent would you say oh i i don't think i have a big enough sample size to estimate a percentage but my roommate in bible college was the girl who explained things and there's a girl who explains things at every bible college and people come to her room and she sits down and explains things uh and my roommate was the girl who explained things <laughs> And so, like, how many people would, how often would she get people asking her to? Oh, it was, like, a constant flow. There were people coming in, like, weekly or more with no clue. With no clue. They're just, like, you know what it looks like down there. No, they don't. I've never seen one. Yeah. What does, what? Yeah, like, 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 people, I, I think that a lot of people have a general idea, but there are plenty who do not. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh. That's that's what so I mean we heard in the Steven Anderson episode right that at Hiles Anderson College there was a seminar with a doctor and the seminar was for all the engaged ladies uh, but Steven Anderson got super mad about it having like diagrams right so this is what we're talking about here that's the 90 days before talk you're supposed to attend days that talk at Hiles Anderson and there isn't one for men that I'm aware of which is confusing I'm not sure how that's supposed to work for men. But you go to that talk or you get an IFB approved sex manual or you talk to your parents and that's how you're supposed to find out about how you actually do the sex. And that's Mm. not supposed to be until 90 days before you get married. Of course, so many people get abused before that that I'm not sure why they even keep up the pretense because unfortunately, that's how a lot of people find out. Wow. Okay. So say you've been abused. You You won't even know exactly what it is that happened to you. Right. And then you could go into the seminar and then you could have your like PTSD severe. Like, yes, this is a thing that happens. This seems like a disaster. Like waiting to what? I would not say this is common. To my knowledge, this isn't something that happens a lot, but it does happen every once in a while that somebody gets to that. This is how you actually do it. Talk. 
and realizes that somebody has been sexually abusing them their entire life and they didn't know what sex was. So they did not know that they were being abused. They just knew they were supposed to submit to somebody's authority. What? Right. This, I, I again, I wouldn't oh. say it's common. I do know that it happens. And this is why you do not keep appropriate details from children when they're at an age that they want to know details because it enables any abuser who has access to them, church or non-church. Right. Because if you don't know that somebody, that something someone's doing is wrong, then how do you, ah, this is the consequence of children who do not have age appropriate, developmentally appropriate sex education and terms to use for their own bodies. I mean, I just thought that it was like that the whole like, oh, no, sex education thing was like, oh, we can't tell them about birth control or, or, or contraception. No, no, it's like it's it's so much like no, deeper like and the, deeper and deeper. Than the that. logic wow. is like if you don't know how to do it, you can't do it. But if you don't know how to do it, then you don't know like that what's being done to you is wrong. Right. OK. Which is a thing that happens both inside and outside of the church. But back to I want to get back to like the IFB teachings on sexuality in marriage. Because they're they're predicated on a couple of things that I would, I my opinion would be they're just wrong. So they teach that men want sex basically constantly. That old trope that you've heard about men think about sex every seven seconds, which mm. I don't know if that's true. Do you think that's true? I wouldn't say seven seconds. Okay, that's what I figured. But they also teach you that women don't want sex that women have very little sex drive or none at all women don't enjoy it at all sex is just something that you do to make your husband happy and then hopefully he will give you what you want they also teach and this was a a very transactional marriage here yeah but but they also hate sex work figure that one out so the, the other thing that they teach is a very very jack scott thing they teach that sex is a biological need for all men that they can't go for more than 72 hours without sex or they will become angry, aggressive, and basically unable to function in life. Can confirm this is 100% true. <sighs> <laughs> Sorry. No, uh, in all seriousness, no. Is, so is this only true for married men or is this also true for unmarried men? So say you're a man, you are not married uh, in the IFB, so you are ostensibly a virgin, then... Literally nothing you ever do is rational and you're going to be super angry 100% of the time. That's that's what I'm getting here. I'm not sure. I think this is just a blind spot in the teaching because from what I know, I don't think they teach unmarried men much except for keep yourself under control. I'm not sure mm. how they handle this with the guys. Maybe an ex-IFB man will write in and let us know how how they treat this. I can tell you that a lot of leeway is given to unmarried men for being irresponsible and flying off the handle, generally being reckless. And maybe this is why. I don't know. You know, I remember being 19 and I was f***ing crazy. And that's without all of this teaching. I should probably give you and our audience some fair warning here because it's just going to get more and more f***ed from here. Oh. What these teachings lead to is the idea that you as a woman are never going to like sex. It's always going to be a chore. But if you don't do it enough, your husband is going to cheat on you and it's your fault. So if you're a teenage IFB girl, you don't know what sex what sex actually is. All you know is it's going to hurt. It's not going to be fun. Your future husband is going to enjoy causing you terrible pain. And you're going to have to do this at best boring, at worst painful thing at least every three days minimum for the rest of your life. So they're telling you that this is supposed to hurt. It goes back to to virginity tests, which were an ancient thing like Middle Ages and before. And also a thing that some doctors will still do, which they should lose their medical licenses over. Mm. But the idea that the idea that we're always taught is it's at least going to hurt the first time, but possibly every time. And I think the message the, the message that I picked up was. It's going to hurt real bad at first. And then if you're lucky, it quits hurting. And then it goes someplace between boring and repulsive. So I like to go to the gym uh, pretty frequently. And one of the things that, you know, like they teach you this in PE class is that if you're going to exercise and you don't want to get hurt, you have to, you know, stretch. You have to do some warm ups first. So do they teach you any of that stuff or is it just like, OK, wake up first thing in the morning. We're going to go dunk a basketball. One IFB approved book does teach people actual accurate expectations for sex, but a lot of the IFB has banned it because it uses Bible verses from a translation that's not the King James. So they're just like, go straight in, no preparation. 
basically, if you're a wife and you're not at least psychologically, if not physically ready to dunk a basketball at all times, that's your problem. And it's probably because you have a spiritual issue that's making you have a bad attitude and not submit to your husband. This seems like this isn't the best outcome for either party. Like, this is yeah. not how you get the results that you want. Well, yes. And also, there's a dark side to this whole teaching. Like, that wasn't the dark side already. That that was pretty dark. Well, the so teaching me... is that it gets worse. Oh, yeah. So mm. the teaching is that you owe your husband sex and that you should never say no and that no woman ever really wants sex. You just have to do it because God says to. And the dark side, of course, is a lot of marital rape. So... I'm just I'm just going to finish finish up all the bad stuff. So you go back and you combine that with your husband having control over the way that you look. So if you're an IFB wife and your husband has a preference for blondes, but you're brunette, you better dye your hair blonde or else he's going to cheat on you with a blonde and it'll at least partially be your fault. So if you are an IFB woman, you've been waiting your whole life to get married. Right. And that's, this is what they've been telling you, that, you, you know, you're going to get married and that's like your purpose. Mm -hmm. And so you're excited to get married. But are you also terrified? Because I assume that you've like you've never been alone with your husband because there's always been a chaperone. Right. 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 So you've never had a chance to discuss this with him beforehand. Like he's going to go into this thinking, OK, we're going to get married. Then we're going to have sex. That's what's going to happen. One hundred percent. Like we're, like it's going down. And you can't say no, even if you're like terrified that what he's going to do is really going to hurt you. So if you're lucky, mm. maybe you've gotten to have some kind of conversation with a chaperone like Maybe you had a chaperone who went and sat way on the other side of the room so that they could see you and make sure that you weren't engaging in any illicit handholding, but they couldn't hear what you were whispering to each other. Maybe over the phone, maybe your parents approved of you having a conversation over the phone without a chaperone. Maybe if you're really lucky, you, you read the one somewhat medically accurate Baptist sex manual separately in like, you know different times, different places, and then talked about it. But if you've been raised this way, you don't... If you've only ever read words referring to anatomy, you don't know how to pronounce them. And you are also not, you've never been allowed to say those words. So you're scared of saying them, like words that have anything to do with anatomy or sex. So it would be really hard to have a good conversation about anything because you're dealing in like euphemisms and words that you don't even know how to pronounce. Wait, even, so even like medical terms. Yeah, even like medical, like this is the name of this activity or body part. You can't say vagina. No. What are you saying instead? I don't even, I don't know. I didn't like get IFB married, so I don't know. Like you're, you're just going into this just like no idea what's going on. You're just like. Yeah. And, and it's like some people get luckier than others. Some people manage to be adequately prepared and be okay. But a lot of people don't. So 90 days before your wedding or 91 days before your wedding, all you know is that you can't say no to whatever sex is. And if you don't provide for your husband's needs, your life is going to be terrible. And if you're lucky, you know, you know, Sadie's roommate from Hiles Anderson, who's explained all of this to you and is going to be like, look, it's going to be fine. You might even like it. Like, right. Like if you yeah. if you had the guts to go visit one of the explaining girls, <laughs> you're better off. But you've been programmed with this very negative thinking about sex. Like you've been programmed to think that it's really probably never going to be good or fun for you. It gives you a fucked up view of men. It gives you a fucked up view of sex and it gives you a fucked up view of marriage. So what about the other side of this? Because that's that's really messed up. Say you get but like look at from like the men's side of this. Say you get married, your new husband, uh, he has been building this up in his head for literally years and years and years and years and years and years, and years like as as you do. He has let's say a bit of performance anxiety. So the flag's only flying at half staff. You've been told all your life that men are just like super horny all the time, that they're just like ready to go. So what's going, what's going through your head? Are you like, Oh no, like I'm not pretty enough for him. God does not approve of our union and is not allowing him to be attracted to me. Or like I think this would really be a terrible situation for both people involved. Because the wife in this situation has been told that men want sex all the time. And she's going to feel, like you said, she's going to feel bad about herself. And then he's going to be trying to reassure her, which is not 
really a great way to set the mood. So say, you you know, you have an emotional bond with this person, uh, hopefully, because, you know, you're getting married to them, but you haven't spent enough time alone together to get the level of intimacy. So like, this is like, you've only just kissed for the first time that day. Like, how are you, how are you going to have a real conversation about this? You're like, I'm like, I'm sorry. It's not to do with you. I'm just like really nervous. And you're like, I like, are, are you going in there? You're like, I, I trust that he's telling me the truth or I think he's lying to try to make me feel it. Or like, you don't have the emotional, you don't have the intimacy to deal with any kind of problem. And you don't have the language to talk about what is going on in the situation. And this is an extreme case. This is an extreme scenario because I'm sure that not every IFB church teaches these things about sex. I think this is a major problem for second generation IFBs. It, from what I've been learning, I think that the experience of a first generation and a second generation person is vastly different. The people who were born into the church who didn't go to public school were homeschooled, went to AC, Christian school. I think that they have a much more extreme situation in the second generation than the first. So how common is it that maybe like you don't do it the first night or like you warm up to it the first night and then you do it on the second night, like you build up to it? You know, I left before like I left when I was 20. So a lot of people in my peer group in the IFB weren't quite married yet because I grew up IFB and not IBLP where they get married at like 19. Right. And so you, IFB, you're getting married, what, 21, 22? When you graduate from Bible college, so 22, 23 is the most common. So I could, I don't know if I could give you a good statistic on that. I hear that it's very common, but I was just, I wasn't, com I wasn't both feet in, in the IFB by the time people my age who would have shared that with me were getting married. So I, I don't know if I could say for sure. So if you had this experience or like, you know, somebody or, or you run in those circles, please let us know, because this is like, like, this is deeply disturbing stuff. You know, I mean, I would hope that like, I mean, I guess like if you're like waiting for this and you're like, well, I've been waiting all my life. What's another day? I guess that's how you really see who's who's kind hearted and who's not who's willing to like be patient with you and who isn't, you know, because this is this is like this sounds like it'd be terrifying. This is making me oh. think about the, the old joke about the newlywed bride who threw her husband's bowling ball in the toilet. Um, Y'all who were, used to be IFB probably know that one. I'm not going to tell it right now because I'm depressed because <laughs> that was awful. <laughs> No, it was awful. This is like really this is messed up because they're like preparing you. They're like, you're going to get raped on your wedding night if you don't want like. Right. Well, they're. Uh, yeah. And and so that's how. That's so awful. Okay, so, well, imagine being imagine being me as a teenager. I'm being told this is what the man who loves you most, who swears to love you and protect you for the rest of his life. The man who is the very best to you out of all the other men, this is how the best man in the world is going to treat you. So imagine the impression that that gives you of how all the other men are going to treat you. Yeah. The man who loves you the Ooh. most is entitled to rape you and may decide to do that. The man who loves you the most is entitled to control your entire life and you are required to walk on eggshells around him and make your entire life about him. And if you fail and he hits you or hurts you or leaves you, it's your fault. And that's the man who loves you the most. So does it make sense why ex-IFB women are afraid of men? <laughs> yes, absolutely. 100%. Okay. Yeah. So, mm. so, okay. So, so when you and I started hanging out, does it make this sense so why I had weird. to go find somebody that I trusted and be like, hey, is this guy going to hurt me? Right. Well, I think that, I mean, that's a thing that women do anyway. That's but true. Also, like definitely as ex-IFB Huh. Like this is this is why I mean this is why women are, are afraid of men, but this is especially why ex IFB women can yeah. have a really difficult time trusting men. Is this also to do the, one of the reasons why? Like I know we talked about this earlier that uh, that you thought that you know worldly people are just like out here fucking, like every night different people, and that like when men get out of fundamentalism, they think that that's what they're gonna get. And then they're like, oh, wait, no. And so they act like super crazy and super creepy around women. Is this like mm -hmm. the other side of that? Yeah, I think it is. They think, OK, well, I am entitled to. Oh, yeah. I so hate it... this so much. Oh. Well, I do, too. But Obviously. I think. <laughs> you were taught this growing up. Jesus. Yeah. This is so it, it, so it, it's a lot of work. What the shit? To, and takes a lot of patience from, from partners outside the cult to work through this complete bullshit. 
actually one preview to something that's coming on next week. We recorded an interview. Uh, next week we have an interview with somebody and she talks about not this, but she talks about um, just like the PTSD that, that comes with, you know, and, and having to learn to trust your partner and having a partner that's patient enough to work through mm-hmm. that with you. Um, yeah. She, really she gave some, yeah. some really, that was one of the best parts of our conversation. Although I love the entire thing. Y'all listen next week. I'm so excited. Okay. Let's, let's end this on a lighter note. Let's talk about a couple things that the IFB teaches about marriage that are actually true. Okay. Yeah. So in our primer episode, I think you mentioned that there were a few teachings about marriage that the IFB like surprisingly got right, but we didn't go into great detail on them. There are a couple things that it turns out in my experience, not always true, but tend to be true. So the first one is that most men need to feel respected more than they need to feel loved and vice versa for most women. Of course, the IFB says that this is all men and all women. And of course, they speak in completely binary terms. But I think that generally, most people who identify as men prioritize respect over love and vice versa. I mean, they do. I don't know if that's best for them. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like as a generalization, I like I I, I don't want to say this is correct. I also don't want to say it's like fully incorrect. What I think is correct... Okay, so let me rephrase it and see what you would think. Yeah. So if you rephrase this as some people place love as a much higher priority than respect, and some people place feeling respected as a higher priority than feeling loved, and you need to figure out which one your partner is, and you need to make sure that they feel both respected and loved, but you can learn to prioritize the one that's more important to them. Yeah, I think that also and this is as as a man this is my perspective on this and and just sort of like how i was socialized maybe i think that men are told by society that the most important thing for them is to be respected i would say that's true as a result of this i think that men often seek validation through avenues and often with results that are more and more detrimental to themselves and the people around them because they are told that being respected is the most important thing when if they were conditioned that maybe being loved is the most important thing, then that would be the thing that they're pursuing and they would be happier and they would feel more sufficient Mm -hmm. and not just like chasing a dragon of like more, I need to be more respected. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, I can get with that. But also a counterpoint, if society has told your male partner that being respected at home is a priority and he has internalized that, you would do well as a partner to still fulfill that need of making him feel respected, even if you're just doing that temporarily while he's working through that social programming. I think that's fair. I think that respect is like a medal, but love is security. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But if you have a partner who really needs to feel respected and the things that they are asking of you that will make them feel respected are not unreasonable, I think it's fine to try to provide that need. If you're getting a fair shake in the relationship, if that, you know, people need different emotional feelings. If you can try to provide what your partner needs emotionally, that's a good thing. If it's not an unreasonable expectation on you. That's true. No, I'm I'm, I'm with you. Yeah. Another thing that I think is often true that the IFB taught is that a man not feeling respected or appreciated at work can cause problems at home. Now, I would apply this to all genders, but I know a couple of years ago when I had just started the job I met you at, Jonathan and I were both just feeling undervalued and underappreciated at work. I and don't we, doubt it. They really did. On their phone. <laughs> oh, my, mine was worse. I'll tell you. I'll tell you. Mine was, mine was worse in my opinion. Yeah. I, I got a better job and he became more appreciated at work. And when that changed for both of us, we quit bringing that negativity home. It really did make things nicer and easier at home. If you boil that all the way down to people bring home problems from work and a spouse or a partner can really help with being supportive, I would say this is absolutely true. Oh, yeah, that's totally true. Another thing that the IFB definitely got right, uh, they always taught us that a good meal will fix a lot of problems for a man. (laughs) I think this goes for everybody, not just men. But yeah, a good, preferably hot meal will do people a lot of good. People forget to eat when they're stressed out or in crisis or don't want to eat. And if you as a partner step up and gently force them to eat something, that can really make a difference in someone's mental state. You keep saying all this stuff. All I want to do is find a beautiful Jewish woman and like cook her chicken tacos uh, when she comes home from work. You really would make a great IFB wife. I would absolutely complain about the air conditioner, though. That's, yeah. It's so, too so cold in make... here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how many uh, Jewish mothers does it take to screw in a light bulb? How many? 
Oh, don't worry about me. I'll just sit here in the dark and suffer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. See, that's that's the kind of levity that we need on this podcast. Yeah. Sorry. Um, we were talking about marital rape like 10 minutes ago and now we're that's that's uh, our <laughs> yeah. welcome to the leaving eden podcast we go through the bad stuff and then we bring you out of it and then we laugh about it and we're like so another one that is true i have two more that i think are true one is that your partner will occasionally say things that just rub you the wrong way and come off as disrespectful or mocking or snarky they they didn't mean it it's a good idea not to jump to the conclusion that they did mean to be ugly and to ask them about the ask them about it instead. Finally, the IFB marriage tip that I use more than any other. This is one that I absolutely swear by. Wait for the right time before asking your partner something. Like wait for an opportune moment. Like don't just bombard them with questions when they're in the middle of something or when they first walk in the door from work or when they're stressed out with something else. If what you have is less important or less urgent than what they have going on, just wait for the right moment and your request or question will be taken much better. That's the thing, though, is that the thing the thing that I'm sort of getting with a lot of these teachings, though, is that these aren't teachings that are exclusive to the IFB. I mean, these are, are it's like the broken clock thing. But like I was at a wedding a couple weeks ago or it wasn't a wedding. It was a first anniversary party where they got married during the pandemic. And so they had the, the like the the fake wedding after like a year later on the first anniversary anyway they did you know the thing that they do where they're like uh if you've been married for five years stay standing if you've been married for 10 yeah. years stay yeah and they find the couple that's been married the longest you find a couple that's been married for like 68 years and you're like do you have any advice for the newlyweds and they'll say something like that yeah yeah i think that's accurate and it's given me a perspective on this it's hard when you come out of a cult and you immediately what you want to do is reject every single thing they ever told you. And it's a real monkey wrench in the reject everything plan when the cult just happened to be right about a couple of basic things. Mm. It makes you doubt everything. And in my relationship, this has really affected me because I worry, because I have anxiety, I worry if they were right about this one thing, maybe they were right about other stuff too. See, this is one of the things I was thinking about, that it's... um. It's difficult. You can't really start a cult if everything that you say is like just completely bull****, right? Right. There's, you, you, there's, like, there's, there's always a kernel of truth somewhere. You can't get people to buy in if you're just like saying crazy. I mean, maybe you can because you have to be a real good salesman. Because a certain, a certain, <laughs> sci yeah, a certain sci-fi writer made up a, a completely new god named Zenu, told people they had engrams in their soul. They had to get him out with his electronic machine. But like, the, like the thing that, but even like with that, they market it as more like philosophy and like with the arc triangle, right? That's, that's, that's real. true. No, you're right. They do have something that's real. No, what you have to do, you can't be like 180 degrees from the truth. You got to be like 90 degrees from the truth. Yeah. No, you're right. You know what I'm saying? I'll keep that in mind when I start my cult. It goes hand in hand with the emotion control thing that we were talking about, because if you start, to reject teachings that you haven't fully been able to deconstruct. Say your partner comes home from work, they're angry, they're upset, and you know, not at you, at something that happens. Say a customer was really mean to them today and they internalized it and it just made them feel really bad about themselves. You've come to reject this idea. Say, say you've come to reject this idea that the man needs to be respected in his job or whatever, but you're still on that toxic positivity train. Like you so your deconstruction part partially, but you're not like fully then like maybe you either invalidate your partner's feelings or you feel like it's you he's unhappy with and that you aren't good enough to make him feel happy. That could cause a serious problem. Yeah, I do yeah. that exact thing. If my mm. husband is upset, I immediately assume that he's either upset at me or that it's my fault because I didn't prevent whatever, I didn't do my job as a wife and prevent all the stressors in his life. I did not anticipate his every need and play some kind of 3D chess to make sure that he never has a stressor. And that's mm. that's 99% of the time, that's not true. That's too much responsibility. That's not even possible, man. Right, but that's the expectation of which I hold myself because that's what I was trained. <sighs> Yeah. And as we all know, in the real world, there are stressors in a person's life that a spouse has no control over. I can't control my husband's job. I can't control the traffic that he drives in or whether some uh, Land Rover 
runs a red light on Burnside and almost runs him over. It, it, you know, those things happen and he's going to be someplace between annoyed and upset over it. And it's not my fault. And I can't fix that. If he's tired because he didn't sleep well, it's not my fault. And also, I can't give him two hours of my sleep to fix it. But I blame myself for not somehow magically knowing the night before that he wasn't going to sleep well and doing something to magically fix it. I get upset with myself. Here's a question for you. How were you taught that that like that that like loving somebody is anticipating their needs? Yes. But only if you're a woman and the person you love is a man. Cuz a like there is some truth to that, but also like if there's a need that you didn't anticipate, well, that's your f***ing fault for not anticipating. Like, yeah, it gets, well, I mean, yeah. I I do, I, I think it's a good thing in relationships to, you know, if you know that your spouse wakes up and unloads the dishwasher every morning before they go to work and you do it for them sometimes because you anticipated their need, that's good. Like, that's a good thing right. to do in a relationship. But you can't blame yourself. Like, you cannot make it your responsibility to anticipate every need and prevent every source of stress in their life. You can't. Yeah. And that's what the IFB teaches women specifically to do. And that's just too much. It, it is. Like, this affects me. And I'm working through it. I do fine. I'm okay. But this is something that affects me. And I hope I'm not the only one because that's going to be embarrassing. <laughs> But I, I bet you there are a lot of other listeners, a lot of listeners that this affects as well. Like, you know, you internalize stuff so badly. If you're if you're a person with anxiety, you think that like your automatic assumption is that it's your fault. And I think that's the more universal thing. Yeah. Well, I think that's really relevant because I've talked before about how the IFB is a pressure cooker for turning out adults with anxiety and even people with real diagnosable anxiety disorders. It's this kind of thing that does that. Because it's, it's not like being told that my existence was to serve a husband and that I would always be subservient to a man, that my existence is only important because of the men that I serve and the men that I birth into this world. That's damaging. And I'm not saying it's not like that's bad. <laughs> it's not a good thing to tell a little girl. But I think that being programmed with these messages about anything that goes wrong in your husband's life is your fault. You have to anticipate all of these needs and fulfill them before he even knows that he has them. And these like negative teachings about sex and neg negative teachings about marriage. I think programming somebody with that from a young age is possibly more damaging than just straight up misogyny. Because that's because you can overcome, you know, if you're if you're taught misogyny, you can overcome that. I think it's easier to overcome than overcoming the anxiety that just gets instilled to you. And that could be like last a lifetime. That's something that like you're going to have to manage. You might not even fully get rid of ever. Yeah. And people people ask me how I deal with that. And uh, it's it's a pretty simple answer. I just know that I know that I do a whole heck of a lot better now than I did three or five years ago. And I know I'll do better than I do now three years or five years from now. I can accept that my brain chemistry and thoughts may never be exactly what they would have been without that influence if I know that I can continue to get better and if I believe that I will be better off five years from now than I was five years ago. I always want to express to people who are kind of in the thick of coming out of this that there there's a good future. There may not be a perfect future, and I think that, that people need to accept that, but there is there is a good future on the other side. Anyway, uh, I think it's about time for us to end. We uh, did everything. We did, we did terrible stuff. We did jokes about the terrible stuff, and then we did a positive ending. That's our show. <laughs> uplifting at the end so next week uh this is something that we are really excited about next week we have an interview with heather heath she's got a book coming out actually the book is already out by the time you're hearing this she's got a book coming out uh it's called lovingly abused heather is x i b l p x a t i if you like our show you gotta get heather's book it's coming out or it's already out um but next week we have an interview with her. She's hilarious. Okay. She's she's like me, but way funnier. You might know her on TikTok as backslidden harlot. She's oh, she's so funny, man. She could have and her, her own book show. is hilarious. Uh, her book made me fall out of my chair laughing and also made me cry. So definitely, um, definitely an interview, an interview you're going to want to hear and a book you're going to want to check out as well. 
Yeah, hundred percent. If you like our show, you should you should get the book because the book is like the same sort of tone as our show, where there's a lot of really rough stuff that she goes through, but then she's like, "But here's a joke that I made about it. This is isn't this kind of funny? Isn't this kind of ironic?" Yeah. So her sh- is rougher than mine, but her jokes are funnier, so it balances. <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, Sadie, do you want to? Uh, I'm going to plug this podcast social media so you can follow the podcast on Facebook. And Instagram at Leaving Eden Podcast on Twitter at Leaving Eden Pod. Join our Facebook group if you haven't already. It's facebook.com slash groups slash Eden Exodus, E D E N E X O D U S. Same name for our subreddit. So it's going to be reddit.com slash r slash Eden Exodus. Thank you, everybody that showed up to our Reddit AMA in R I A M A. A Sadie did an AMA. Got like 5,200 upvotes. It was wild. It was on the front page of the site. Sadie, would you like to plug your social media? Yeah, you can follow me on Instagram at Sadie Carpenter Music. You can follow me on Twitter at Hell Yes Sadie. And if you want to see me eat the infamous Duggar tuna barbecue sandwich, you can follow me on TikTok at Sadie Carpenter One. Yeah, she's going to be doing more TikTok soon. So keep your I have, head a, I have a series that I've already been filming. Uh, I'm trying to get ahead of myself, but then I'll release them when I get done. <laughs> yeah, you have a baby, so you got to do things when you can. And you I can have follow a baby, on, so everything yeah. goes around nap time and bedtime. You can follow me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Clubhouse at G-A-V-R-I-E-L-H-A-C-O-H-E-N. And uh, until next time, next time we've got this interview coming up with Heather. We've been planning out all of our episodes coming up. It's all really good stuff. We know that you guys are going to love it. Uh, Anyway, uh, until next time, bye-bye. No regrets, no confusion